This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Catherine, and I are going to talk about backstory. Why do you need backstory? Uh, Robert, I understand you have been looking into some examples of writing that brought this question forward for you. So do you want to set us up here? Yeah. Look, Anita, I was born um, actually in Australia. Not a lot of people realize that. Um, And uh, because I lived in England for the first half of my life, uh, I was about three weeks old when I went back to the UK. Parents took me back there. Um, And it was pretty about the age of eight where I started reading furiously. And that's where I got my love of literature. Um, And look, to cut a long story short, because (laughs) you know what needs to know my backstory, (laughs) Um, I've been looking in um, as part of a a service business I'm involved with where we look at authors' books. It's interesting when you go to, say, a look inside or read a synopsis to to see that there are parts of the story that act to explain why the story is where it's at or the age of a character or the setting that they're in. Um, and just like I did there with referring back to where I was born, unless someone's been specifically asked about that or it's relevant to the plot, it just got me thinking. I know we, we've talked about backstory and, you know, you, you, you tried to deliver it just in time. Um, but is there a case for saying my story actually doesn't need any backstory? You know, my story is my story. So, you know, if I want to talk to you about how, I travelled uh, to to watch my daughter performing French horn a couple of weeks back. I don't need to start with you know her uh, her last year in high school and how she managed to get accepted into the into the uni, um, unless that's specifically related to some aspect of the performance. And even mm-hmm. then, you could argue what it would be delivered at that moment. Um, so you know, how much do we risk popping the reader out of the story, losing momentum? Um, you know, ruining the sense of attachment to the character that we may have. Um, yeah. So it just got me really thinking <laughs> as to that we don't need it at all. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say we don't need it at all. But in your musings about backstory, you've already provided us the why we do need it and the what we risk when we don't use it effectively. So we could just call it call it done right there. (laughs) The, you know, do we need backstory? We need backstory when it is relevant to the now story. And let's go, let's push it even further and say when it is essential to the now story, when it is essential to the reader's understanding of what is on the page in the moment. And it might enhance our understanding of the character. It might set up motivation or something situational to the plot that is going to drive us forward in the story. But if it feels like we have just stepped out of the story to look at something tangential, if we've just moved sideways instead of forward, then it's not serving your story well, you know, unless you are writing the kind of story like one of the Russians where you're going to enter a village and give us the history of the village for 500 years before you move the action forward. But that's not typically done by writers today, and most readers wouldn't appreciate it. So, you know, there could be a story where that's appropriate and desirable, not to the extreme, but where we want a, a richer tapestry to um, as part of our narrative instead of just straightforward motion all the time. So it's a balance, you know, depending on the story you're telling. Yeah, I suppose in our, um, our sort of uh, binge-driven society where, you know, if, we, if we're not hooked in the first 
minute or two on the latest Netflix series, then it's it's not going to get its uh, its watch through. And the same for for books. Mm-hmm. There is a maybe some of the culture, the lit- literature culture, has moved a bit in, especially in terms of genre fiction. I think um, where you've got you've kind of got to hit the mark pretty quickly with, with an impatient audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I don't disagree with that. It's I think it's there's a certain sense of sloppiness that comes sometimes where you just feel like this has been shoehorned in because the author felt the need to explain something. Right. And it really isn't the part of the story. Uh, it's It may be as a part of, in their own mind, you know, uh, uh, I'll come I'll come at it slightly differently. Um, in neurolinguistic programming, you have this thing with all meaning is contextual. In other words, um, you know, if a kid threw a stone at another kid, he, most of us would react in horror and go, oh, my God, that's a terrible thing to do. But what if that other kid was about to push another kid in front of a railroad track, you know? So it, you've got to sort of put everything into its own framework. And to some degree, I think that's what, as authors, we think we're doing by giving backstory is we think we're setting context. But mm-hmm. to me, context comes also behaviourally. So you get to understand through the evolution of a character in a story what that context might be. And I agree with you, if you go the other extreme um, and it's not there at all, especially in, I think, in in settings such as science fiction and fantasy where your context isn't always immediately obvious either. You mm-hmm. don't know what the rules of the, 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 the planet are or you don't know what the, the magic rules or the political system is in the kingdom or the realm. So there's some degree where you've got to sort of slip some stuff in. Um, but, right. it, but it got to me thinking that it's as we write, we often we've got in our heads, we've got this sort of picture of what's going on and the, and the context within it. <laughs> and it's a little bit like you want to sort of, uh, you know, do the, the classic aside. So, well, you know, Bob, the reason why we're in this castle today is because. <laughs> right, right. And let's um, let's be really specific about how we approach backstory here because it's not just um it's not just going broad with our setting or with our world building or something right. you know i was thinking of my current work in progress i have an omniscient narrator so i will do things like tell you what uh well so for example a woman in this town thinks my protagonist stole her dress off of the clothesline. And my narrator shows you that it was her husband's hunting dog who pulled the dress off of the clothesline and ran into the forest with it and played with it and tried to bury it and peed on it and stuff. Right. So it's not backstory. It is not exactly moving the plot forward. It's more of an aside you know, more like sideways momentum than forward momentum, but it's part of this narrative. It's part of the richness I'm striving for. But what is backstory is when, um, you know, a character is motivated to do something specifically because of what happened to her in the past. And we need the reader to understand that. Right. So, when I think of backstory, I am primarily associate it with our characters. What yes. is it in this character's past that we need to understand now in order to stay with the forward momentum of our now story? And, you know, you could say, what is it in this village's past that we need to understand about the history of this village to understand the social context of the villagers now, right? So we can expand our sense of character a little bit there. But I think, you know, to what you were describing, Robert, a lot of writers will will do all of this development for their character and build a rich history. And when I work with writers, I like to separate history from backstory. History is all that work we do to understand our characters' lives and persons that doesn't get in the book. And backstory, that's the piece of the history that we need to insert at a very specific moment in our story for the benefit of the reader, 
Yeah, it's the it's the part of the context that gives the meaning. So you don't right. need the, the whole context. You just need the bit that ne- gives you the meaning for the story. So I suppose if if to answer my question of you know why do we need backstory, it's because occasionally without it, the context would just leave the reader completely muddled. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you opened the show by saying where you were born and how old you were when you moved to England and moved back and things like that. So we could say, okay, that's Robert's history. We don't need to know that for the benefit of this conversation on the podcast. But then later you mentioned in NLP. So what might be relevant backstory is to say, you know, for this time frame, I was trained, I was a trained NLP practitioner. So yep. that's maybe a good at working present example of the difference between history and backstory and relevance to our yes. audience. Yep. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Catherine, <laughs> you can, you can, you know, it's coming. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm like stuck in my brain, like reviewing books that have started with a lengthy act one that feels a lot like history, but it's not because it does serve the story by presenting a really strong. And this is, I think, something that also you see a lot more in your fantasy and your science fiction and things where they're setting up maybe the growth evolution of the character to get to their act two. Um, So that's where my brain immediately started going into, um, you know, the the richness of that act one that is mostly backstory and history, but that has been woven into the story itself, right? Because it serves the purpose of the setup to the character having that moment of change and moving out into act two. So I just wonder, I guess it's one of those things that's kind of genre dependent in terms of what your character needs and how much of that character growth you want to be showing on the page for the story versus, you know, like leaving it for a reveal later in the story or like when you want to have it feel more like a, oh, like I now understand why. And I think that's something in backstory that I really love as well is when you get into a middle of an act two scene or whatever, and you don't fully understand why they're reacting that way. And then all of a sudden you get that piece and you're like, ah, dots connecting. Right. So I think Mm -hmm. I kind of went two different, like completely two different examples of different uses of backstory and, and create crafting that richness for the character. Right. Well, and we have to be careful with wanting to insert backstory into act one because act Mm -hmm. one is brief and it's about introductions and setup. So you have the opening, whatever style or flavor of opening that gets the reader enticed into the book. Yes, I'm going to read this book. And then the remainder of act one is meeting our character, understanding what her life is like before that event that launches the plot that changes everything. Did you miss the live creative writing workshops I held this fall? If so, don't worry, they are still available as pre-recorded, self-directed workshops at storyworksfiction.com. You can get writing backstory into your now story, weaving together character, plot, and theme, and making your readers fear and fear for your characters today. Each three-hour writing workshop includes examples, discussion, exercises, and you benefit from the students who did attend live. Their questions, my answers, the group discussion. Give yourself a writing treat. Sign up today at storyworksfiction.com. For her. And so there, we shouldn't be getting a biography. We shouldn't be getting this character's history. We should be seeing who this character is now and what her life is like because it's fiction, it's story. So we know something is about to turn that life on its head, right? right? So the relevant pieces of history that come later should be tied into our main story, not our introductions and set up act one chunk. Mm -hmm. And I think where I maybe was confusing a little bit was like 
those fantasy novels that start with, you know, he was six years old and here's a scene when he was six and then here's a scene when he was eight and then here's a scene when he was 10 and here's a scene when he was 12 and here's a scene when he was 14. <clears throat> Wheel of Time. Um, <laughs> and then, well, I mean, I think, I think it's been a while since I've read Wheel of Time, but it does start where he's young, right? And then there's, I'm thinking a couple other um, Jacqueline Carey novels and um, I'm, anyway, I'll put them in the show notes, but I'm just thinking of these long epic introductions where you get the character growing up in act one and then you get them having that change when they're like I don't know 16 18 19 depending on the fam- fantasy series right but you get to see them growing throughout act one which is a little bit different than mm-hmm. what we're talking about here with history and backstory so I think that's what was confusing me was like getting sure. that rich background for the characters differently than having a backstory Yes. And I think that word background versus backstory, that makes a nice distinction for us. Mm -hmm. And that, that, um, you know, method of introducing the character at different stages of life to show a progression that will work in some stories and it won't work in other stories. Mm -hmm. And I think we're wise to make it distinct from backstory. You know, Mm -hmm. you could open with the character who's 12 being sent off to boarding school and then have within that a piece of backstory from when he was six and, you know, he tried to take a cookie and his mother slapped his hand. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so you could still have backstory within these chapters, these smaller frames that are slices of his life before we even Mm -hmm. get to the main story. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And my mm-hmm. argument with those is that it takes a very experienced author and editor combination to be able to pull that off. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just this is what I've been seeing recently, where I, you know, I'm looking at the look inside. I'm thinking, you know, that should have been tightened up a lot more. Right. There's too, mm-hmm. there are too many flashbacks. There's too much uh, almost throat clearing. But, you know, I mean, where's the story? That's mm-hmm. so that in my head is, and it'd be different. I think, you know, your example, Catherine, where that you've got that progression, if it's done by a really skillful author, then we're attached to the character at every stage, at every age. Mm-hmm. There's probably a mini story with a mini arc in each of right. those that's mm-hmm. enough to keep us interested and go, okay, where's this going? Where's this going? What happens next? Right. Um, and, um, I'm trying to read recently. Oh yeah, I read. Uh, I got a advanced reader copy of a, a of a book um, that's got quite a bit of interesting backstory in it that is all, that is just left unsaid throughout the whole book and it only really completes at the end. Um, and uh, and it's uh, it'll take too long to go into, it, but it's remarkably <laughs> done. You know where we do get flashbacks. Um, but it's just enough of a snippet to leave you hanging. And you go, what? <laughs> right. It's it, it's a, a psychological thriller. So obviously, you know, that kind of thing works mm-hmm. well. That sort of technique works well. Right. In a psychological it's like thriller. a pieces of the puzzle that, that they're trying to weave together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really yeah. fun because then you do, you get the, like the reveal of the whole backstory at the end. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I suppose that answers my question. Why do we need backstory? <laughs> when in my particular case, it's <laughs> there it is. Yes. Yeah. You know, another mistake writers can make is they insert backstory because they know the reader needs to know this, but they don't insert it in the right place. And so yeah. when the reader encounters that backstory, it seems irrelevant. And by the time it becomes relevant, the reader may or may not remember it. So you want proximity. You want the backstory to be matched up with the moment in the now story when it pulls something together, when it makes meaning, when it connects dots for the reader. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that is tricky. I, I mean, I can, I think that's happened to me where I've been doing revisions and gone back and said, Oh, why have I done that there? That's a bit clumsy. You know, I could take it out of there and put it in somewhere a bit closer or, or, or a bit more succinct. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's it's uh, it, when you first come out with first draft, and it's okay to do that first draft. You know, think, oh, I can need I need something explainy in here. You know, so oh right, well, I'll just explain <laughs> it, and then when I come back in revision, I'll make it sound. You know, I'll find a way to to let that come out in conversation without it. You know, sounding like a you know you know Sarah. 
type of thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, you know, without thinking that you've got to get this all right in first draft because that, that would be crazy. Right, right. Because if I go back to where I was thinking about this, it, you, when you're in first draft mode, you really are immersed in, in you know, that the movie of the head or you're hearing the characters talk or whatever it is. So, of course, there's going to be context in there that you're getting as the author because you're distilling that down and and putting it into compressing it, diluting it, not diluting it, um, what do you call it? Distilling it, distilling it into words that mean something on the page. But, you know, we're either overwriters or underwriters, so you've, mm-hmm. you've got either not enough words to explain what's on the page or you've got too many that put too much context <laughs> there. So, so it's not surprising, I suppose, that if the editing process itself is not thorough, then that might be where I'm reading something and feeling like it's it's lacking some ex- an extra pass or two of polish because mm-hmm. there's too much throat clearing or flashback in there to explain stuff where it didn't need to be there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's possible too that you know it might be the right place to insert the backstory, but the writer is using the not best method of giving backstory right. because you can you can give backstory succinctly in a bit of narrative exposition, just a sentence mm. or three mm. that explains to the reader, you know, quite easily what happened you could also use flashback where you you are taking us out of the scene and into a totally different scene in the past which means all of that development of setting characters etc however brief the flashback is it's still a full scene being presented on the page or you can have your character reference it and use dialogue so then the current action isn't interrupted at all, not even by a tight snippet of exposition, but we get that reference to the past that fills the reader in about something, you know, and with each method, you need to pick what is best for the forward momentum of the story for if you choose dialogue, but then your character is talking to a sibling so they have a shared history your character is not going to explain the past to the sibling he's just going to reference it because they both already understand the history so then dialogue would not make clear to the reader what that backstory really is or really is about right so not the best method then you should go into exposition or flashback unless you want to keep it intentionally obscured to create intrigue for a larger reveal of the past to come later. So, you know, you have to really pick and choose carefully when you think about when and how to insert backstory into your story. That's interesting. Yeah, I didn't even thought about it like that, but there are many techniques to to use a reference to context or past um, you know, we can have the character thinking about it. We can have a line of exposition that's just narrative. We could flip point of view. We could have another character, supporting character, somehow, you know, contrive it in, in a way that works, obviously. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, that's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about siblings and backstory and confrontation. <laughs> Right. Yeah. It's great for confrontation because usually when we're in a confrontation, there is backstory that's making that conflict more intense and more pointed than it Mm -hmm. would otherwise be. You know, it's our buttons getting pushed. And Mm -hmm. so you're thinking about the buttons your character has available to push and why this situation, you know, is so flammable. There you go. There's a use for backstory to heighten your conflict. <laughs> right. <laughs> Interpersonal conflict. Right. Mm-hmm. You just, just don't use the entire act one to set it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, never. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't do that. Are there other mistakes you've seen or other complaints 
you have from from writing you've encountered around backstory? Um, I, when you when it's done with um, you know, you get a lot of tense uh, flipping. You know, so you've got you're in the middle of something where a, a character is in full action, and when I say action, I mean you know they might be driving somewhere or you know something underway, and then all of a sudden you've got all the you know they had done this and this had happened, and you know it's it you you've got to be I think very careful that all of a sudden we slip into a, then a, a previous past, and that tends to pop me anyway a little bit out of. Uh, what you know what's happening here mm-hmm. um so too much flipping in in tenses i think needs to be very heavily contextualized and again i suppose that's down to what technique they're using and you know how how that particular reference to some something that happened in the past or something that existed in the past is done mm-hmm. right right you never want your backstory to interrupt your now story, it should always contribute to the forward movement of your story, unless Mm. you're in a traveling chapter. So you mentioned driving. So let's say I need my character to take a flight and I show my character settling into the airplane seat. Well, odds are I don't need anything dramatic to happen on this airplane. So this is a great time to trigger the flashback because then it covers the notion that time has passed on this flight, right? So it can serve that purpose of getting our character from A to B while serving a larger, more important purpose of adding necessary context through backstory to the action that has just happened or is about to happen. Yeah, I can give an example to that um, that we were introduced to in, in the story grid when they were talking about the um, uh, science of the lambs, um, where um, Clarice gets on the plane with uh, her boss, um, and it's just a it's a you know three seater. There's a pilot and the two of them. They they have to fly off to interview somebody somewhere. Um, and he chucks the file onto the back seat where she is and says, you know, here, you better catch up. And and so you get some of her thoughts about, you know, the file and, and uh, you know, what they know so far without him having to sort of turn around and say, Clarice, let me bring you up to up to speed. You know? And it's a thing that fits absolutely perfectly with the characters, the character of her boss, the type of work that she does, the sort of thing that goes on, you know, yeah, okay, big fat file that she she hadn't seen it before. Why hadn't she been given this before? There was all sorts of really interesting complexity around it as well. Yet it was really just a method to deliver some exposition. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great example where it's done very well. You know, when I, when I think of... Um, Doctor Who's assistance, that's kind of the label I give to <laughs> those moments, which tend to feel very clunky, where you've got yes. dialogue around, well, gee, what does this mean? Yes. Gee, sorry. doctor, can you explain <laughs> this planet or this event or this, you know? And then all it is is a setup for the know it all character to, to yes. monologue. And to explain to the audience, yeah, to info dump. And so, you know, with narrative and with our character's point of view, we have much more interesting ways to present information to the reader at the essential moment, right, while maintaining that forward flow. That's the key to it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, And Mm -hmm. I I suppose that's probably where to circle right back, you know, that question of why do we even need backstories? Because when it's not done seamlessly and it doesn't move the story forward, that's when you look and you go, why did this even have to be here? So that's got me even questioning it. But, of course, you know, if I'd recently read some books where there were backstory in there that I didn't even notice, I wouldn't be asking the question. Mm-hmm, um, so I suppose that's what we should do when we're in editing and revision stages as, or, or if we are editing somebody else's work is why does this need to be here? What's it doing to move the story forward or add to the story? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. When, when story is working, 
we don't notice how it's working. And when it's yeah. not working, then, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? It falls apart. <laughs> I think that's the, one of the difficult things actually about um, deconstructing masterworks is that every time you go to read them, you just get sucked back into the story again. <laughs> God, this is so good. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.